And uh, let's see here. And I just want to make sure I have all the counselors. Brayden Murphy, Royal. Okay. All right, we will get started. Um, thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, for the record, everyone, my name is Andrea Campbell, and I'm the District 4 City Councilor, and I'm also the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. We are joined, let me just make sure I have this right, in order of arrival. We have Councilor Braden. Thank you. I know we were had some technical difficulties there, so thank you, Councilor Murphy and Councilor Arroyo, uh, in the order of their arrival. Thank you for being here. I want to remind everyone that this is a public hearing. It's being recorded, and it will be rebroadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, Files Channel 964. It's live streamed as well at boston.gov slash city-council-tv. We will take testimony at the end of this hearing. So if you wish to testify, please do um, signal by just raising your hand. And I will also ask folks when we wrap up the testimony um, to receive testimony. I will just, when we wrap up the hearing uh, at the end, I will seek public testimony and ask that folks keep their comments uh, to two minutes. Today's hearing it is, is on three different dockets. The first is docket number 167, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend in the amount of $13,520,000. It's in the form of a grant for federal FY21 Urban Areas Security Initiative. It's awarded by the United States Department of Homeland Security. It's passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and is to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Emergency Management to support a whole host of things, including planning, exercises, trainings, and operations that build regional capacities to help prevent, respond to, and recover from threats or acts of terrorism, including chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive incidents. The second docket is docket number 1207, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $106,575 in the form of a grant for the FY22 DMH co-response grant. This was awarded by the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. It is to be administered by the police department. It is to fund a full-time recovery coach slash forensic pair specialist to assist the Boston Police Department officers with hub and center of responsibility meetings uh, citywide. And lastly, docket 1209, message and order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend in the amount of $72,600 in the form of a grant for the FY 2022 jail slash arrest diversion grant. This was also awarded by the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. It is to be administered by the police department to fund some overtime costs to fill backfill crisis intervention training and other mental health training for officers. All three of these dockets were assigned to the committee. Uh, the first was referred to the committee on November 17th, the other two on December 1st, 2021. Um, it looks like the administration, we're gonna have actually Jenna go first, uh, just given time restraints which is fine with me. Let me just expand my screen so I can actually see you, Jenna. Hello. Hope you, and of course, everyone's doing well. Thank you for being here. So what dockets are you uh, testifying on? The last two? Yeah, I've got the two. Also, I really like your haircut. Um, oh, I've, got the two, I've got the two DMH grants. Okay, so let's start with docket number 1207. We'll take them one by one, and then we can go into docket 1209. Sure. Is that the 106, the 106,000 one? Yes, exactly. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yeah, well, I, these are both DMH grants, and good morning, good afternoon, I guess. Uh, so the the first one, the 106,000 uh, grant is from the State Department of Mental Health uh, to help us hire one full-time forensic peer specialist slash peer recovery coach that we hired through BEST, but also co-supervised by PARI, who will also provide some training uh, in recovery coach training. Um, the reason for this, just to give a little background, is we used to use these co-response grant funds to hire one of our BEST clinicians, a full-time uh, best clinician, but now that we've got operating budget funds to support our clinicians, we want to keep them all on the permanent operating budget just to make sure they're stably funded, but we still have these grant funds. Uh, so DMH was kind enough to work with us to kind of figure out a creative way we could still use these funds to help improve our mental health response. Um, and we figured out that we could hire through BEST 
but again, also in collaboration with Pari, uh, full-time recovery coach slash uh, peer specialist. So this is going to be someone who has lived experience with both mental health issues and addiction. And so they can work with our officers. And the, the, the major need here is for our hub tables. We're, we're starting hub tables citywide and the peer recovery coaches and uh, and forensic peer specialists will play a major role in helping people get, you know, kind of basically directed right to services, uh, right from the hub table. Uh, so it's going to be really helpful. We're actually looking into revising this so we can hire two positions instead of one. Um, but this is a really, really great grant. Thank you. And I'll actually have you provide a, a quick overview of docket 1209, and then I'll go around for questions from the counselors. Sure. The other one's also really simple. We get we get several DMH grants. Technically, we get three, so two of them we're talking about today. Uh, this other one is the training backfill. It's literally just for backfill so that we can get officers mental health training, uh, particularly CIT training, which is 40 hours. So it's basically taking officers off the street for a week. Uh, and so they obviously need to backfill. It's the only cost for this training. The trainings are free, but we do need to backfill. Uh, so DMH has been great giving us these annual grants that just allow us to get more and more officers trained. Um, and I'll also just plug that our third DMH grant that we already have active, active and up and running is to develop our own CIT training. Uh, so we've been sending our officers to Somerville and Brookline, uh, but we are going to be developing our own training that's really specialized towards what are our resources in Boston? What are our needs in Boston? And we're going to train not only our own officers, but officers who work in hospitals and local universities and state police, anyone who's really working in, in the city to really uh, improve me you know, mental health response. Uh, but I think backfill will continue to be needed as officers are taken off the street for this training. Thank you, Jenna. That's very helpful. I'll, I'll go around uh, to my council colleagues for questions in order in which they have appeared. And I want to acknowledge Councillor Flynn has also joined us. Um, I will start with uh, Councillor Braden. Any you. questions on, doc on these two dockets? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I think I'd, I'd like a little more uh, information about the backfill, um, the backfill uh, funds. Uh, I know from talking to our officers at precinct um, district 14 out here that a huge number of our emergency calls are mental health and and how would the how would the resources be um, allocated across the whole the whole city well these specific resources are literally just for backfill so again officers get some mental health training in the academy just regularly when they're hired as new officers or through in-service uh, but CIT training which is crisis intervention team training is a very extensive 40-hour training that allows officers to rec you know recognize mental health problems uh, de-escalation is really very far, strongly emphasized. Uh, it helps them understand which resources there are in the community for veterans, for you kind of name it, the juvenile brain development. There's different modules on all different sorts of responses. And so these funds are literally just for allowing officers to go get that training. But while they're off the streets, we need we still have to keep a minimum manning level in the districts. Uh, and as far as who gets the training, it's it's voluntary. Uh, but we're often looking at, you know, we our first priority is often those officers who ride along with best clinicians, because that's kind of like the magic formula of having the best response would be having a master's level clinician riding with an officer who, who's also had this extensive training. That's really just the best possible outcome. Uh, but anyone who's interested, command staff, specialized units, pretty much we're trying to get, you know, especially once we have CIT at our academy, we're going to try and get as close to the full department trained in this as possible, because the reality is no matter where you work, you're going to encounter mental health. Uh, that's just kind of how that goes. Yeah, I think this is a wonderful initiative. And, um, you know, the mental health, someone in a mental health crisis, um, if you're a, an officer responding, sometimes it can look uh, a lot more threatening than, and, and knowing how to de-escalate a situation is really critically important. Um, so I really appreciate that this is really useful funding and, and necessary. Thank I you. think that's all I have for now, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Uh, Councillor, let me get my order right here. Let's see, Councillor Murphy. I am um, no really specific question and um, thank you for um, holding this hearing, it's so important. And just listening now about the different grants and funding going forward for this training is so important um, for our offices to be prepared. And also the, a question when you were first talking about recovery mental health coach, I was thinking like in my head that it was to support the offices and I'm realizing now it's different, it's training. So when they're out on the street, so. Just looking forward to the conversation and thank you. No sure, question. Just, just to clarify, so that first grant is actually, most of it's gonna go into subcontracts with BEST to hire recovery coaches and PARI to help supervise them. 
So there's really no funding going to the BPD directly for that other than indirect just to oversee the grant. And then the training backfill one is 100% just BPD, just backfill uh, so that officers can get trained. Awesome, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Uh, Councilor Arroyo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to be clear, this is on docket uh, 1207. Uh, 1207 and 1209. Thank if you, you have any no questions. questions yep. Thank you. Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Councilor Campbell. And um, I apologize. I'm in my car, so I pulled over to um, participate. So thank you. Um, I, I missed some of it, so I, I apologize. But I guess my question is, could could I get an explanation, a little bit of background on the actual training? Is it a is it a kind of like an academic type training? Is it a hands-on training? Is it a, a seminar? Um, who who are the instructors, and you know what what do the police hope to learn um, through this training? Sure, great question. Uh, mostly, it is used for CIT training, which is a forty-hour training of both in classroom, but also they do like hearing voices where they'll, they'll listen and try and see what it's like to try and function in, in the real world while you're actually hearing voices. They take visits to different places. So it's a very hands-on 40 hours of training, again, em emphasizing de-escalation and recognizing mental health, uh, you know, what different disorders could be, uh, also substance use. Uh, so that is the training, but we also will use it to get like eight hours of mental health first aid for some people. We used it previously to get the Boston School Police uh, the Boston Public Schools Police, uh, we got training for them in mental health first aid because uh, so it's really any mental health training uh, just to provide the backfill for that. But usually it's it's classroom hands on. Uh, there's actors that come in, will play some roles, some role playing. Uh, so it's a really, really hands on training for mental health. Well, thank you for the, the response. I just wanted to add prior to being a city council as a probation officer at Suffolk Superior for, for almost 10 years. And we had this type of mental health counseling training um, similar to what you described and it was it was very helpful to me and my colleagues um, doing probation work and i just want to acknowledge the professional job that you are doing and just and just to say uh thank you thank you Th thank you councillor campbell thank you uh councillor flynn uh i think that's i think that's everyone Yes, it is, in terms of counselors. So, Jenna, I'm all set with these two dockets, unless there's something you or anyone from the department wants to add. No, nope. I'm happy to stick around till the end if there is any testimony regarding it. I'll, I'll stick around just to hear anything else that might come up. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And now I'm um, going to, uh, let's see, first docket, which is docket number 1167. And who from the department is going to testify on this particular docket? Madam Chair, good afternoon. Shumane Benford, Chief of Emergency Management. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, ma'am, myself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll have you take over and just uh, give overview some details with respect to this docket. There's a lot more questions on this one because we received some questions from folks in the public, so we can go through some of those questions. I know we submitted some of those prior to, so I'll let you take it away and then we can go around to counselors for this particular docket. Thanks for being here. Sure, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, uh, thank you very much to you uh, as well as the other chairs and uh, excuse me, other counselors as well as others uh, on the call uh, today. Uh, I am joined uh, by uh, the deputy uh, chief here at uh, OEM, Nancy Anderson, uh, who will be available to assist uh, in testimony as well. Uh, and I know that there are other stakeholders uh, that may benefit uh, from this grant that have uh, joined the audience uh, and may have some testimony. Uh, the city of Boston, <clears throat> excuse me, together with uh, eight other jurisdictions comprise the Metro Boston Homeland Security Region. Uh, OEM is the fiduciary uh, of the MBHSR, which encompasses the jurisdictions of Brookline, Cambridge, Chelsea, Everett, Quincy, Revere, and Somerville. Uh, the, uh, over the course uh, of the last 20 or so years, uh, the MBHSR has received uh, 200, approximately $230 million from the Department of Homeland Security's Urban Area Security Initiative. Uh, and it should be noted, ma'am, uh, that it is specifically uh, uh, managed by uh, FEMA within uh, DHS. 
Um, it should also be noted that this award uh, is granted to regions uh, that have been identified uh, by the federal government. It doesn't go to any one jurisdiction uh, within the MBHSR, but it is, uh, it is awarded to the region for which the city of Boston uh, is a partner. Uh, this grant uh, funding is designated, uh, designed to adjust the unique planning organization, equipment, training, and exercise needs of high threat urban areas while simultaneously building an enhanced sustainable capacity to prevent, protect against, respond to, and recover from uh, acts of terrorism. Uh, these resources also support the ability of our respective region and jurisdictions uh, to be able to respond to national and man-made disasters. Some of our partners uh, on this grant uh, and in this space, ma'am, uh, the MBHSR, uh, uh, EOPS from the state, uh, the fire service, uh, EMS, public health, uh, the election department, as well as do it uh, with some of the respective areas of funding. We collaborate with our regional partners to allocate these, uh, these funds using a risk-based methodology and projects funded through the grant, uh, grant focus on the following eight mission areas. And I just want to pause there in two areas. Um, when it talks about that risk-based uh, methodology, uh, one of the things uh, that they use, uh, which is a scientific process that is identified uh, by, uh, by FEMA and DHS, and it's called the FIRA, uh, which is short for threat has identification and risk assessment. And what that does is it helps guide jurisdictions and helps to guide this region uh, by awarding projects and investing in areas for which that process uh, has identified uh, are vulnerable or require additional support by way of funding and or programming. Just by way of process, ma'am, if I could just uh, just give a just a brief high level overview. So the grant is typically awarded and you mentioned it in your earlier uh, comments. The application is actually submitted by the state uh, but we provide a host of information on behalf of the region. Uh, it uh, goes over uh, to the state. And what we know uh, right off the top is, is that the state uh, is eligible to take up to 20% of the grant. Uh, for which they do, uh, that typically rests within EOPS. Additionally, uh, there is 30% of the grant, which is mandated by grant guidance uh, to support the four national priority areas, uh, which is cybersecurity, uh, enhancing the protection of soft targets, information and intelligence sharing and gathering, and addressing emerging threats. Once uh, the beginning of the year rolls around, we typically uh, employ a process called the abstract process. There is a subcommittee uh, that operates that supports each of these mission areas. They also comprise the subject matter experts from the respective partners and disciplines that help to identify the projects within the spirit of uh, the grant guidance, as well as the spirit of the MBHSR uh, for recommendations on where we fund projects. Uh, once the projects are identified uh, and, and again uh, worked within the uh, mission area, they are recommended uh, to the JPOC, which stands for Jurisdictional Points of Contact. They are uh, individuals uh, that are identified by the respective jurisdictions, uh, the chief executive, uh, the town manager, or the mayor uh, to serve as the representative. Once they identify uh, these projects at the subcommittee level and they're recommended to the JPOC, that is where uh, the debate uh, engages around uh, funding. Once we identify the funding, uh, the funding source, and we narrow down the funding so that it fits within the grant award, it is then uploaded into what's called the grant reporting tool. Uh, this is a federal tool uh, and product that is used to submit grants on a unified uh, platform to the federal government. It goes over to EOPS. EOPS reviews it and then approves it. And as I mentioned earlier, EOPS then approves the application and submits the application. And then in reverse, the state, as you mentioned, ma'am, uh, it comes in as a pass through to the state um, and then it is awarded uh, to the respective region. There is a general three year performance period. That performance period actually begins when the grant is awarded, uh, excuse me, when the application is submitted. So although it says that there's a, a three-year performance period, by the time the funds are actually available, we're typically on average around six months into that three-year performance period. So I just mentioned that uh, obviously as uh, time passes, so too does the performance period, uh, but that's generally uh, the snapshot of it. Those uh, eight specific goal areas, uh, I'll just uh, tick through them, safety and security, critical infrastructure protection, intelligence and information sharing, interoperable communications, Cyberni, which is short for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive detection, medical surge, 
planning and community, and community preparedness and cybersecurity. With, res uh, with respect to the 2021 grant, I'll just run through a quick snapshot of the overall funding in each of those uh, respective uh, mission areas which align with uh, the grant application. So uh, the first goal area, uh, strengthening community safety and security includes projects totaling $970,000. Uh, resources in this area uh, includes things like generators, light towers, message boards. And as we know from the pandemic, we have uh, you know, adopted a whole of community approach and using all available resources to help us work through different uh, man-made uh, and or otherwise uh, other uh, scenarios that may impact our area. And some of the obvious areas that I point out for which we often enjoy uh, from a social and a civic uh, standpoint, but nonetheless, these resources go to support like the 4th of July. Uh, we use video messaging boards to help the city respond to the pandemic response. Uh, we've used these resources uh, to assist with elections, ensuring that we have an unimpeachable process uh, during major events. Um, and we also use them to support the ongoing efforts at Mass and Cass. Uh, lighting towers have a host of different uh, added resources uh, and value uh, to how we operate as a uh, region in the city. Uh, mission area two, uh, approximately $2 million, and this is the area to strengthen infrastructure and protection. The region is continuously improving physical security enhancement measures at critical infrastructure sites. Uh, projects include the purchase and installation of equipment designed to enhance security at police facilities, fire stations, emergency communications facilities, and public works buildings. We've also used resources to help support the infrastructure coming into City Hall. So uh, many of uh, the security assets that you see at the entrance uh, to the Boston City uh, Hall, as an example, uh, many of uh, those assets were purchased with resources that came by way of this grant. Additionally, uh, we know that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we look at uh, when we look at our national priority events, uh, there is a process called a SEER rating, uh, and that's a federal process. But what that does is the federal government looks at major events in assessing uh, these respective regions across the country in terms of the level of funding that they receive, and they look at the types of events uh, that are held in these particular regions and they assess a value to them. And when we look at our SEER rating, when we look at that process, we know things like our nationally recognized Boston Marathon, our Fourth of July celebration, those are all critical areas that receive a SEER rating or federal designation uh, to be able to uh, support uh, bringing in federal assets as well as these resources going to support it. I would also mention in this area uh, some of the equipment that we purchased. Uh, we know uh, at the beginning of this past summer, uh, we uh, experienced a very difficult period where we saw a rise in drownings both in the city and in the region. Um, and a lot of this equipment uh, was uh, instrumental in helping to locate uh, those families and, and bring closure uh, for the difficult periods for the families. The third mission area, uh, strengthening intelligence and information sharing. Uh, this area uh, in this particular grant year has $3.1 million uh, designated for that mission area uh, to support the, the work uh, in this space. Uh, I would mention in this space, uh, you know, the integration uh, is essential for a coordinated response. As I talked about a whole of community response and a whole of region response, we respond very differently today than we did 20 years ago. Uh, so the ability to be able to share information uh, and to integrate uh, with our partners across various different disciplines, not just in public safety, uh, critical and essential. The fourth mission area, strengthen communication interoperability, uh, includes projects totaling approximately $2.4 million, ma'am. Um, and we know that, uh, again, uh, in this space here, some very, uh, some very difficult lessons learned from 9-11, um, as well as the local experience here uh, and the valued ability to be able to coordinate the response during the Boston Marathon bombing and other proactive and response-based scenarios where we know that uh, the technology has been helpful uh, in ensuring that we have uh, consistency across the board uh, with uh, infrastructure to be able to bring in the, the necessary resources to help us manage through our public safety uh, realities. I'm almost there, ma'am. Uh, fifth mission area. Uh, in Take your time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, fifth mission area, approximately 1.5 uh, to strengthen chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, explosive detection, response, and recovery capabilities. Um, and I just want to uh, mention in this space here, when we talk about the proactive response, uh, obviously the calls for service, 
but uh, you know, we're a city uh, of winners uh, in great pride. So all of our uh, celebratory uh, events that we have, uh, particularly when we're willing, uh, when we're winning uh, national championships and so forth, uh, this type of equipment, the training, the resources, and the assets are extremely helpful in the pre during and after uh, of these major events and ensuring that they're safe, not just for our residents, but the families and the many guests that come in to uh, enjoy uh, those times with us. Uh, they're also uh, critical for uh, the seamless integration of assets brought in to support major events. So I talked about the Boston Marathon and receiving that SEA rating. And with that type of rating, it brings in and deploys a whole host of other resources that come in to support our ability uh, to protect our city uh, for all those that are here to, uh, to enjoy the festivities, but also to participate. So it's essential uh, that we have the uh, infrastructure and the assets uh, to have that capacity and be able to seamlessly uh, integrate. Uh, the sixth goal area, strengthening medical surge uh, and max prophylaxis capabilities. Uh, we know that uh, in this particular space, uh, our, our EMS uh, nationally recognized for the work that they do, uh, but they are also a regional leader uh, and they have uh, they, uh, the lead for procuring certain resources on behalf of the private ambulances and institutions and other support assets uh, that they use to help support delivery of services. So uh, it is extremely important uh, that uh, we continue to have uh, that capability. And again, want to recognize EMS for the work that they do in this space, uh, again, both nationally and uh, regionally uh, in their placement and how they support our response uh, to, the, uh, uh, to EMS and uh, life-saving needs. Goal area seven, uh, strengthening planning and community pre preparedness, approximately $1.2 million. Uh, training and exercise funds are dedicated to regional events taking place uh, across the region. Uh, things like uh, aerial imagery data, uh, this data is used proactively by places like uh, and institutions uh, like ISD to be able to see rooftops um, in some of our major buildings uh, or in other places for which their resources would uh, limit their ability. And that's used, again, from a proactive standpoint to help uh, with strengthening regulations to assist with inspection of buildings uh, to keep our infrastructure safe. This space here is also uh, essential for our ability to engage community education projects uh, as well as preparedness uh, for our residents uh, in our region. This is extremely helpful because we know that through a lack of information and a lack of knowledge, uh, many of our residents and our guests in our city become liabilities uh, in areas where we have to support them as opposed to being able to educate them and bring them aboard and along as partners uh, in our public safety response. So there are resources in this space uh, to, to uh, as I mentioned, around $1.2 million for the region to help educate uh, to educate our city and our region. We also use these resources during the early days of the pandemic. Uh, we were able to, we know that we had significant uh, shortages with regards to PPE. We were able to use this money and some of the flexibility that FEMA uh, ultimately granted uh, jurisdictions across the country, uh, some flexibility and some leeway to be able to use those funds. And we were able to purchase initial rounds of PPE so that we can ensure that our first responders as well as our municipal partners had the PPE necessary to continue to work through uh, those early days of the pandemic. Uh, and we also uh, use these funds in this space to develop leaders and develop training so that our, uh, our uh, municipal leaders and our regional leaders have the uh, core capabilities as managers uh, and have the knowledge base to be able to manage through uh, these uh, different crises that we experience. And then coming up on our final two mission areas, ma'am, <clears throat> uh, cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity uh, is, uh, you know, one of the biggest threats and biggest concerns uh, that are identified uh, across the country, which is why uh, FEMA and DHS have designated this as a national priority area to receive no less than 7.5% of the total award to support initiatives uh, in this area. Uh, directly tied to cybersecurity is our election system. So again, we have uh, really expanded uh, in the city and regionally, how we interact with our cybersecurity subject matter experts in the city uh, at CISA uh, at the state level and otherwise to be able to protect uh, our election system. Uh, so this is one uh, critical area where those funds, uh, in addition to cybersecurity, elections is uh, another uh, national priority area and we use those funds to support efforts um, in that particular space. And then lastly, ma'am, uh, program administration and management of the grant, as I have mentioned in the past, a significant portion of OEM's uh, operating funds come by way of this grant. 
um, and that is in the administration and management, the ability uh, and the authorization of the grant to be able to use those resources to support it. And that's what's critical for uh, the city of Boston and not having to uh, own the responsibility of uh, fully funding OEM uh, while supporting um, a regional asset uh, that is not directly um, related to daily operations within the city. So we're able to, in the uh, to the tune of $676,000, it's really capped um, at a fine number based on percentage uh, to be able to support M&A. Um, Ma'am, you mentioned um, at the beginning, uh, there were several questions uh, that were presented um, for response. Um, with the support of IGR, uh, several stakeholders uh, got together uh, to discuss um, a response a response uh, to those questions. Um, we've, uh, in looking at it, uh, we want to be very clear that we endeavor um, and are committed to responding to the questions in a way that is comprehensive, provides the information that you, the other counselors, and other stakeholders need um, to be able to make the decisions that you need to make. Uh, but we also recognize that there are number of different stakeholders based on the depth of those questions that would need to be involved to be able to provide the information. So in talking to IGR, IGR will take the lead uh, in working uh, with us to bring together the respective stakeholders to get the comprehensive responses uh, that, that you and the others need to be able to make the decisions. Uh, in closing, uh, I just want to mention uh, that this grant uh, has, uh, you know, again, granted to the region uh, has permitted us to build capacity that otherwise uh, may be cost prohibitive uh, with local resources. Uh, it has also permitted our region to build a collaborative infrastructure that is the hallmark of 21st century preparation and response. Uh, this sustainable funding mechanism is valued and vital uh, to our regional public safety assets, as well as our cybersecurity election um, and other resources and areas for which we deliver services uh, across our city and the region. Uh, I encourage uh, acceptance of the grant um, and certainly look to work collaboratively to provide the information that would be helpful for you and others to be able to make the decision that you need, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Chief. And, and I will say that we did receive uh, some responses from IGR maybe about an hour or so ago, including um, one document, it's about 50 pages long. I think it details the application itself, um, the years in which the city has received the grant, and then the third document um, broke down some of uh, what the cost, uh, what, what the grant will be allocated to with more detail. So we've already sent that around. Uh, two counselors will also make sure that folks in the community who requested and asked specific questions also rec receive that as well. Um, I will just ask a couple of questions and then I, I will go to my council colleagues who are, who are on as well. Um, Thank you for the, the overview. Thank you for the detail that you provided. One of the questions that came from a few different folks had to do with uh, technologies. What technologies, if any, if any, and I think you've described some of them, will this grant support, um, including a question around will it support shot spotter, brief cam, license plate readers. Um, and so I don't know if that is one question where IGR has to coordinate with some of the other uh, stakeholders. I don't know, but I figured I'd ask it here. And then the second related question related to if there are indeed uh, technologies involved, the, obviously the council recently passed the surveillance uh, ordinance, which doesn't go into effect, into effect until August. Council Royal, I'm sure will have questions related to this as he was one of the key drafters uh, in that um, legislation. So any uh, response on the technologies piece would be really helpful. Sure, um, ma'am, thank you very much uh, for the question. And I wanna start by mentioning there are a host of, uh, which is why uh, you know wanted to ensure that I gave that overview up front about the many different stakeholders. Um, OEM uh, you know, is really that fiduciary and administrative support. So we have a host of other dis disciplines that really serve as a, the subject matter experts and two, the practitioners of the technology. But at a high level with some of the technology that you mentioned in there, the answer is yes. Uh, that uh, these resources do go to support some of that technology, but out of respect and deference to the respective disciplines, I think it would be most appropriate to hear from them as not all of the jurisdictions, and I'll speak specifically for Boston, uses all of that technology, right? So this technology is procured uh, for the benefit of the region based on the spirit uh, and the guidelines of the grant, but very specifically based on the, uh, the very individualized needs of the jurisdictions, they also have the ability to participate in certain instances or not. And I do believe that there are some instances with regards to technology uh, that the city of Boston does not participate in, but I would respectfully defer to uh, the, the individual subject matter experts. With regards to the ordinance, uh, the ordinance is binding on the city of Boston. 
So if there is technology that is procured by the region, and this really goes to my, te to, uh, my testimony that I gave earlier um, when they were uh, debating and talking about the city ordinance, um, it, while it is uh, the resources may be procured on behalf of the region, uh, we still as a city of Boston entity in the respective uh, departments, whether it be police, fire, public health, or otherwise, would still be bound by the local ordinance that governs the city's participation in it. That's a that's very helpful, Chief, um, and uh, obviously has to do with something going forward, which I'm sure many counselors who are on, I will not be here, will um, make sure that they stay in touch with IGR, the department, of course, the current, um, the mayor, Mayor Wu as well. So this is, that's, that's helpful. Um, I don't want to take up the entire time. I will just say for the record, we did get some questions on the application process. Uh, documents submitted to DHS related to the application, um, information detailing how much money the city has received from these grants, which we did get some of that information. So I want to again thank you and your team, and we will provide that to folks who asked it. Um, and then there were some questions on, and I'll ask this one because it's come up before, having to do obviously with the BRIC information sharing, there continues to be a conversation on how to improve the operations within the BRIC, how to improve the gang database itself, including rooting out the racial disparities in that database while ensuring, of course, public safety. Um, and so can you speak to specifically in this grant, there is some funding, I believe, that does go to the BRIC um, and can you just describe what that what that looks like? And I, I think that's present in some of the documents, but I have not had a chance to review every document because we just got it about an hour ago. Sure. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. And um, I want to ensure uh, to recognize uh, the police department uh, and, and those that uh, lead uh, the, the Bureau of Intelligence as well as to BRIC um, for their very detailed response in this space. But what I can say at a high level is, is that the grant itself mandates uh, a certain funding to support fusion centers uh, as part of the requirement of this grant, right? And the BRIC serves as the regional fusion center that supports uh, the MBHSR. Uh, with regards to the detailed uh, overview of uh, the breakdown of those funds, there is some information that is provided in the grant guidance, but I think uh, with uh, certainly the granular details, um, would uh, you know, I would defer to uh, the BRIC uh, and, and the leadership over there to respond to it. One of the things that you mentioned, ma'am, uh, which, which is extremely encouraging and certainly um, you know, uh, certainly has always been our posture um, and will continue to be that. We endeavor to be transparent, endeavor to be, uh, you know, to be accountable uh, to the people and to the process while ensuring public safety. Um, and I'd like to think that having these open and candid conversations enables us to do that. Uh, so um, responding um, within, within the confines of the role uh, that we play in this process, but respectfully would defer to those others uh, to chime in and help to provide those comprehensive responses. I said that we that we hope to uh, get to you with regards to those specific questions. Thank you, Chief. And we can work through IGR as well to get some further in-depth responses for counselors and others who have asked questions as well from the public. Thank you. This is very helpful. I'm going sure. to be mindful of time and go around to my uh, council colleagues, starting with uh, Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have any any further uh, questions. You know, I realize that there's many buckets, many areas of concern with regard to our security. Uh, cyber cybersecurity is an increasing concern, um, and it's you know it's good that uh, and there's a regional response being developed to try and keep keep us all safe. Um, I also want to thank you um, as you depart from our city council for your leadership of this committee and thank you for all your great work um this uh, this is more i'm not a member of this committee but i pop in and out from time to time and i've always been so impressed with your 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 really your approach to hearing all the voices and and getting to the truth at the end of the day so i want to thank you for your for your leadership and i'm going to miss you thank you counselor i'll be seeing you i'm sure <laughs> Yes, thank you. And um, I have to jump off for another meeting. So if you pardon okay. me, I'll, I'll jump off. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Um, and to all the folks who are here uh, from the departments testifying, this is my last public safety hearing, hence Councillor uh, Braden's comments. So thank you, Councillor. Um, before I go to Councillor Murphy, just one quick question. I know that um, Winthrop was previously, I think last year, in the region, right? In the included in the communities, non-communities. I don't see them now. Are they not a part of this anymore? Or are they? 
Ms. My Carver. apologies. If, if by chance you have any documents that suggest that they are not there, that was an oversight. They are still a, a, a member of the MBHSR, yes. Awesome. Thank you, Chief, for that clarification. Sure. Councilor Murphy. So I do want to echo what Councilor Braden said. I feel fortunate that I was able to join you in this of your last um, hearing, but probably our first together um, with you chairing. So I'm happy to be here to in, know that even though you won't be in the same role, that you'll be a resource to me going forward. And we will definitely stay in touch on this topic and many others. So, because I really appreciated your leadership when you were on the council. So thank you for that. Thank you. But also, um, and just want to thank you, um, Chief Benford, for just your thorough explanation of the grant, explaining where the resources are going to go and no I may ask if we could, I think Councillor Flynn, you might be unmuted. So there's sort of an echo. Oh, but I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Uh, Councillor Arroyo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I echo everybody's thoughts, but since I think I might be doing two rounds on this one, I was gonna save them for after the uh, last round of questions on this. Uh, Mr. Benford, or, or Chief Benford, if I can just ask you, uh, in terms of the actual monies being spent on surveillance and things of that material, are you unable to speak directly towards that surveillance? When, when, so, Councilor, just to make sure I understand your question, are you, are you talking overall dollars uh, that are committed to surveillance? No, no, I mean in terms of implementation. So are you basically here to uh, administer the funds to, say, Brick or somebody else, and then they're in charge of how those tools are being used? Is that, is that essentially what's happening? That, that is correct, Councilor. Yes, sir. And so I guess my question is, are you able to... Uh, individually answer questions about how they are using those those tools that we are funding with this grant. So at a very high level, um, we, we, we can provide a justification at a very high level as part of the application process. Uh, however, with regards to the specifics, uh, it would I would defer to them uh, to be able to respond in the most appropriate way, sir. Thank you. And Madam Chair, is, was Brick invited? Sorry, I was on mute. So it was Brick invited to this? I do not know. I, Michelle, was Brick invited through IGR? We did send I, questions beforehand, but I'm not sure. I don't believe that we had um, members of individual departments um, invited for this hearing. Okay, but so we did send questions, and we can, um, and IGR is sort of sending them to respect the respective departments. So we'll make sure that they have these questions. And so, and, and then the uh, the hope is that they get this to us before we vote on this in 48 hours. Is that basically the plan? Exactly. All right. So then let me ask the questions that I have. Uh, and then uh, Chief Benford, if you can answer them, great. If you can't, just, uh, just say that, and then it'll hopefully get directed to whatever place can. Um, do you know under what conditions the surveillance technology covered by this grant uh, can be used? Do we know by which, so, and, and, and again, at a very high level, the federal grant, the, the federal authorization gives very broad-based uh, authority um, on how the technology is used. I think the surveillance ordinance is a really good example of how we have, uh, as a city, worked to uh, define it with greater detail in terms of how it is used. So, again, I would defer to the, uh, to the BRIC to really speak to that. Okay, so that'll go to BRIC. Uh, do you know what kind of data is being collected by the surveillance technology covered by this grant? Again, I would defer to the brick on that, sir. All right, so that can go to brick. Uh, do you know uh, who, specifically what city entities and non-city entities can access the data collected by the surveillance technology? And how yeah. would the entities gain access to that data? Sure, I would definitely defer to the brick on that, sir, for, uh, uh, for the safety and security of the, uh, of the infrastructure and who has access. All right, and then uh, what safeguards exist to protect information from unauthorized access? Uh, I would defer to both the BRIC uh, and potentially some individuals uh, from do it uh, to talk about the infrastructure. All right, thank you. Uh, how long is the data collected by the surveillance technology retained and how is that information deleted? Sure, uh, again, I would defer to uh, both the BRIC uh, and do it on that, sir. 
Thank you. Uh, can collected surveillance data be accessed by members of the public, uh, such as criminal defendants? Uh, I, would, I, I would imagine not, um, but again, I would defer to the BRIC uh, and do it on there. Thank you. Uh, how is information collected through this technology shared among city agencies or between city agencies and non-city entities organizations? Are there any obligations imposed on the recipients of this surveillance data? Yeah, based on the interpretation of the sensitivity of the data, um, again, I would defer to the brick on that. Okay. Uh, what training, if any, is required for individuals authorized to use the surveillance data or technology? Sure, it would definitely be uh, the practitioners, the brick, sir. Okay. Uh, how does OEM ensure compliance with its surveillance use policy? How does it how does it monitor misuse? So uh, just, uh, you know, very narrowly speaking for OEM, I know we have a reporting requirement, uh, you know, under the surveillance ordinance. Uh, so for our usage, uh, we monitor, uh, you know, when our staff use it and how they use it. But with regards to uh, the BRIC and others, I would defer to them. And in terms of uh, the way that this money is used, it would obviously, I would assume, uh, be part of the Trust Act as well. It would fall under the conditions of the Trust Act. So any surveillance or anything like that that is going over to, say, uh, immigration enforcement ICE, uh, does that have to follow the Trust Act? Is that is that basically what happens here with any surveillance? Yeah, I would. So with we got with regard to any surveillance, OEM does not release any surveillance. So I, again, I would defer to uh, the brick on that. Does OEM have any oversight in terms of surveillance gathered with this uh, with this funding? So if brick gathers surveillance, does OEM have anything to do with that other than just? being administrative in, in the form that you are right now in terms of getting them this grant? No, sir, that, that is outside of the scope of our responsibility, so no. Got it. Uh, so uh, I guess if that the next question is, do you know if there are any special considerations in place for surveillance technology and surveillance data pertaining to minor children? Uh, I do not know, sir. And again, we'll defer to the BRIC uh, to be able to uh, possibly respond with a little more detail. All right. Uh, has surveillance technology covered by this grant been used in the past? Is there any new, is this, is this all just already used surveillance tech or are there new surveillance tech or new methods of surveillance being funded by this grant? I don't know about new methods. Uh, certainly this is an infrastructure, as I mentioned, uh, the, the monies uh, first became available in 2006. Uh, so an infrastructure has been built out. So certainly some of the technology is existing. Um, and in some instances, uh, there there is uh, there are recommendations on the floor uh, for the purchase of new technology. But I fully expect uh, that it would be in compliance with the reporting and or approval of uh, the city ordinance, particularly as it relates to the city of Boston. Does it differ in any major ways from previous technology acquisition or use? Uh, I, I can't respond to that right now, uh, sir. I'm not I'm not sure. But I would defer to the brick in terms of new technology and recommendations and abstracts that are on the table. Uh, do you know whether or not in past years this grant has covered the use or acquisition of surveillance technology that ultimately has been shared with local, state, and federal entities? Um, again, I, the, the very specific release of the data uh, is beyond OEM's uh, uh, mandate. However, um, I, I would only speak and say that we have a, again, collaborative regional approach um, to how we prepare to protect the region, um, but I would specifically defer to the brick and the police department. Okay. Uh, in past years, has this grant covered the use or acquisition of surveillance technology that has ultimately resulted in community complaints or concerns? Uh, I, I am not sure, sir. Uh, who would know? Just so IGR knows who to direct that to. Yeah, I would defer, I would defer to the brick, sir. Okay. Uh, how has surveillance technology that has been covered by this grant in the past been effective at achieving its identified purpose? Um, I, I think that there were probably uh, instances that the police department can point to uh, in terms of how this technology has been beneficial, um, but I do not want to cite uh, specific instances uh, while not knowing what specific te technology was used. So again, I would uh, defer to the brick and the police department. Okay, so that would be big brick or BPD. Yes, sir. Uh, what portion of this grant will go toward the acquisition of new surveillance technology? Um, I don't know what portion of it is, uh, but uh, typically uh, they, there are resources uh, that are requested uh, to expand or enhance the network. Um, we can certainly look at it uh, in greater detail. The BRIC um, and others may be able to respond, uh, particularly as it relates to projects that they may have been that may have been submitted. But we can certainly look at the uh, the uh, uh, the just the investment justification that was submitted as part of the application to determine what projects very specifically talk about uh, enhancements and or additional purchases. 
are any communities or groups uh, disproportionately impacted by the surveillance technology that this grant has funded in the past, specifically communities of colors uh, and or other marginalized groups? So again, I, I don't have that data. I would defer to the, uh, to the police department on it. Has the city ever done an audit or anything of that type uh, regarding where and how surveillance technology is being utilized and whether or not it's being used disproportionately on communities of color and or marginalized groups? Again, I would defer to the BRIC or others uh, well be, uh, beyond our OEM's mandate, so we don't track it. Okay, but you don't know of any other, the, the city's, say, office on racial equity or nothing has ever, to your knowledge, done an audit or a study on this? That is correct, not to my knowledge, sir. Okay. Uh, and then in terms of this amount of funding, do we have a specific number that goes to BRIC? Yeah, when, you, when we look at it, we can certainly look at the data, uh, look at the numbers, and we can extrapolate our uh, resources that go to support functions uh, that are provided uh, by the BRIC. But again, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, there is funding uh, that is required to support uh, fusion centers, so there's certainly our resources that go to support it. Thank you. And then uh, finally, I noticed on the uh, what was mailed out earlier uh, that the chair referred to that uh, emailed out earlier that shows sort of the breakdown on the on the funding that there's intelligence analysts uh, yes, that are yes. part of this funding. Are these the same intelligence analysts that will be using and utilizing the gang database? So I would certainly defer to uh, the BRIC in terms of the responsibilities and roles of indi uh, any individuals on their staff, specifically to your question, uh, particularly the ones that are funded uh, by resources from the grant, but I would defer to the BRIC. Okay, and then just a final question on the intelligence analysts. There's a, there's a number of them sort of uh, in terms of the number. And so it would say, for instance, one of the ones I'm looking at, goal number three is intelligence analysts with a specific number of dollars appropriated to that, but it doesn't tell me how many staffers that is, uh, do we know how many staffers were actually, how many people are we putting on employ with this grant? So in other words, on this one, goal number three says Intel and info sharing intelligence analysts, $1,871,000, 260. Are, are we talking about how many jobs is that? Like what, what exactly are we talking about? Sure, uh, the, the brick would be able to identify that they would be most appropriate to respond. Okay, so I guess that's that's all of the questions. I'm sorry that you know most of these aren't for you, uh, OEM, uh, the Office of OEM, but I'm glad that you've directed those to uh, the appropriate place. Uh, and I'm hoping we can get answers because, frankly, it sounds like most of, if not all of these questions, I certainly don't have answers to now. Uh, and if we're looking at voting on this in 48 hours, I would I would really appreciate uh, them. So if this gets sent to Brick uh, and if IGR is listening. Uh, I would really appreciate we get those answers as soon as possible. Uh, thank you. And, and Council, I would thank you. Go ahead, Chief. Bye. Oh, I was just going to mention, ma'am, uh, Council Royal, uh, you know, when we got the questions, certainly in having the conversation with uh, with IGR, it was very clear that we need to have uh, the, the BRIC and other stakeholders involved in the conversation. Uh, and, and I do suspect um, and know through conversation that they're very committed to responding. So, um, again, look forward to IGR's lead and helping us pull that together um, to try and get the answers to the questions so that you can make a comprehensive and informed decision. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, Madam Chair, thank you for your leadership uh, in the last two years. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I think we've we've certainly gotten some things done in this first uh, this first term for me, uh, but you've certainly left a legacy uh, of work. And so thank you for the work that you've done and thank you for the work that you'll continue to do, I'm sure. Thank you, Council Roy. I appreciate it. And, and thank you for your questions. Yeah, we did. And thank you, Chief. We did submit a long set of questions to the Chief and we got some responses. Some have to go to the brick. Um, but uh, Council Arroyo, what would be helpful is if you could email me the list of questions that you sort of just recited. Um, we have some of those already sitting with IGR, but we want to make sure, of course, we have all of them. So if you could email them to me, that would be great. Absolutely. And we can add them to the list. Perfect. My, my, my staff will absolutely do that. Thank you. Perfect. And we'll add those to the list and we'll coordinate, Chief, uh, with IGR to get as many responses as we can as quickly as possible um, before the council meeting on Wednesday. Um, I don't have any other questions other than uh, one specific question. Obviously, there were a lot of questions on just the technology pieces, et cetera, um, and the various stakeholders. And there are many who, of course, can use these resources to procure whatever they want. Uh, every municipality doesn't have the same um, technology surveillance ordinance that we do in the city, which, of course, is another um, tool in our toolkit to be able to provide some more transparency, et cetera, with respect to any new procurement. I'm curious if you know this question, um, 
it, it, which technology is specifically funded for just for Boston? Um, and if not, if that has to be looped in with the technology questions, because it can involve the brick and other departments, just wanted to get clarification. Yeah, so uh, ma'am, I would defer uh, certainly uh, to the BRIC and a host of other uh, stakeholders in that because remember, we purchase on behalf of the region. And as I had mentioned earlier, each jurisdiction with that's party to the region also has the discretion to not participate. So I think in some instances, when you hear from the BRIC, um, I, I think you may hear in some instances that there is technology that uh, the BRIC may or may not use. Um, but again, that flexibility and that discretion always rests at the local uh, at the local level, uh, the jurisdiction level. And for us, uh, you know, the surveillance ordinance is a really good example of how we have to look at uh, approaching the technology that is procured on behalf of the region very differently because we have other rules um, and regulations that we have to uh, that we have to consider in making that decision. Well, thank you, Chief. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if there's anyone else from the department who wants to add anything. Otherwise, I'll take the dockets under advisement. If uh, not, go ahead, Chief. Council, I was just going to close. Um, certainly, um, I have not had to testify before you. However, I have watched uh, countless uh, hearings that you've held in the past. Um, I, too, join the chorus uh, and greatly appreciate uh, your balanced uh, and candid approach uh, in trying to get you the appropriate answers with the information that's needed to get there. So I want to thank you for your service uh, to the to the city uh, and wish you well um, in, your, uh, you know, in the next steps and your next chapters. It will certainly be a loss, but I suspect that you will be an asset and an uh, ally uh, wherever you land, man. Thank you so much, Chief. I really appreciate it. And of course, appreciate your work. Uh, Nancy, Maria, you know, I've, I've worked with many of you over the years and just value uh, your leadership and your work. It's not an easy job that you all do um, in the city and for the city. So thank you all very much. And um, Chantal, thank you also as well for uh, coordinating all of this. Michelle, thank you. Um, I appreciate it as well. And, um, and of course, central staff, Kerry, I appreciate all of you. But before I wrap up, I do want to double check just to make sure if there's anyone in the public testimony space who has some uh, uh, testimony we want to go to to them. Is there anyone signed up, Michelle, by chance? For public testimony? Yes, Madam Chair, we do have uh, one individual signed up. We can okay. bring Alex Matthews over now, if that's all right with you. Wonderful. And I'll wait till I see him. Hi, Alex. I uh, hope you are well. If you could state your name for the record and any organization affiliation you want to share, and then uh, testimony for two minutes, that'd be great. Thank you. Hello, Madam Chair. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Alex Matthews. I'm the chair of Digital Fourth, which is a um, Massachusetts-based surveillance and privacy-oriented civil liberties organization. We are all volunteers. Um, we have been heavily involved in the campaign to get a surveillance ordinance passed in Boston, in addition to in Cambridge and Somerville. And we have been closely watching the decision making of the of the city and of the surrounding communities relating to surveillance technologies. So, um, my um, we have substantial written testimony that we have submitted. We also have a list of questions which we have shared with the chair, but which we are very willing to share with other council members as appropriate, and. All I would like to observe at this juncture relating to the hearing is that these, um, you, you can see a little bit of the dynamic here. These grants are structured to be complex, to include a variety of things that nobody could possibly object to, such as increased PPE for emergency workers, but also to, um, to include at sub-levels, elements that are really very controversial within the city. The city of Boston back in July, the council voted to reject $850,000 in funding for intelligence analysts at the BRIC. Um, for, and they, they did so even though that state money was essentially available to the city of Boston without increasing the burdens on any individual within the city of Boston. And they did so because they had significant concerns about whether funding additional intelligence and analysis at the BRIC 
was an appropriate thing in context of the history of scandals at work. Now here, we see that within this grant, there is $3 million odd that relates to maybe 30% of the funding for the BRIC. And um, this is controversial stuff that the City Council has already re um, um, rejected funding for in another manner. Um, and yet the way the grant is structured is we have um, it's uh, Mr. Benford Bons Boston from, um, from emergency management, but we don't have people from the um, agency concerned directly here within the hearing to respond to the very legitimate concerns of city councillors on this topic. So the combination of so many different elements within this grant hinders accountability and hinders oversight. Um, I'm very grateful to the councillors for doing what they can to get answers to these important questions. And our perspective is that until city councillors are satisfied with um, the answers that they receive as to how these technologies that are funded are actually being used and affecting the lives of Bostonians, then they should delay acceptance of the grant. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, uh, for your testimony. Um, and also what you submitted, we did submit some of those questions to the department. We got some responses, which we'll forward, of course, to you, along with some others who reached out and stay in contact with you. So thank you uh, very much for your testimony and what you sent previous, which was very helpful. And I'm also sharing thank the you. same with um, all counselors as well, so they're kept abreast, including those who were unable to attend. So thank you. Wonderful. Michelle, do we have anyone else offering public testimony? Madam Chair, I don't have anyone else signed up. Okay. So take these three dockets under advisement and um, did want to thank all of you from the department, the various departments um, for your leadership, for your hard work. It's been a pleasure and an honor to serve with uh, as chair, of course, of public safety and criminal justice and to thank central staff. Um, I've worked with all of you, Michelle, Christine in particular. Um, we've, we've juggled a lot of legal things. Appreciate you. And um, Nancy, thank you for your leadership. Maria, thank you and the entire team. Please thank everyone at your team for all of the work uh, and partnership over the years. And Chief, good to see you. And Chief and uh, Jenna, keep taking care of yourselves and thank you as well. I'm sure I'll be seeing all of you really soon. So thank you. And Ellie, thank you for coordinating everything today. And Carrie, thanks. And uh, the hearing is adjourned. Bye, everyone. Happy holidays.